This is the Business of Pop Culture, where we explore the intersection of entertainment, media and consumer engagement. Hello again, Julia. Tell me, what are we going to be talking about this week? We are going to be talking about localized content. And the reason we're doing that is because Disney have just dropped the second season of Star Wars Visions, which is an ongoing animated short project. The first season was really warmly received last year and launched in cooperation with a number of recognized Japanese anime studios. Now, anime is, of course, the furthest thing from a niche market at this point. American companies like Crunchyroll have built huge empires on kind of bringing anime culture into Western markets. But with the second season, I think Disney are doing something really interesting here where they've collaborated with global animation studios to further diversify their cultural lens and bring different reference points from across the world into the way that the Star Wars universe is presented to the audiences. So there's um, studios like 88 Pictures in India, Cartoon Saloon from Ireland, got Studio La Cachette from France, Triggerfish in South Africa. So you've got a really broad spectrum of different artistic and cultural backgrounds to really reinterpret what a Star Wars story could be. So global content, that's kind of local stories, localized stories, but with a global reach. That's what we're talking about, right? Yeah, so localized content is actually something we wrote quite a lot about in 2021 at Stylus, following the huge success of Squid Game and then also the Oscar sweep of Parasite the previous year. And it's the rather novel idea that content that's being created in regions of the world that aren't necessarily Western or Anglophone can have global success as well. So Netflix have obviously had quite a big kind of global perspective for quite some time, but I think they're investing a bit more in K-drama, is that right? Yeah, exactly. So they've announced that they're going to be investing $2.5 billion into Korean TV and K-drama formats over the coming years. And that really makes sense because viewership of Korean TV has increased by 200% between 2019 and 2021 in the US. And companies like Whip Media have found that some 38% of all Netflix shows currently in production are in languages that aren't English, because we are seeing a big uptake in English-speaking audiences for foreign language content. But this is more than just about um, non-Western or non-European stories breaking through, isn't it? Absolutely. For instance, the Norwegian movie Troll is apparently making huge numbers in India right now. I think beyond just looking into what's breaking into the Anglosphere, these specific connections are happening between other regions in the world are actually where the really interesting growth lies. And I think we need to be paying a lot of attention to what connects communities outside of the US and the UK. Now, this is all very interesting this week in particular, because, of course, TV and film studios in America have failed to reach an agreement with the Writers Guild of America, which is the the main union for all the screenwriters in the States. So the WGA is on strike. This last happened in 2007. I guess... It's an interesting time for studios and streamers buying international content when they aren't able to generate their own content, and who knows for how long. Especially with the ongoing voracious appetites amongst audiences for new content. If you're going to tap into a market where production is unhindered by strike action, and especially now that we're seeing increasing proliferation of dedicated passion communities in online streaming distribution models like the fast systems where you can have entire channels dedicated to just one show or say specifically one culture market, I think we're going to see more experimentation and proliferation as some production companies are going to try and make up for revenue gaps. In 2007, we saw a huge explosion of the reality TV format, but we also more vitally saw proliferation of creativity and formats in online video and creator industries. The emergence of transmedia storytelling, the evolution of vlogging into a narrative format and just this almost like a big bang of online creativity. So I think both in terms of creating new international passion communities and new talent that's going to go their own way outside the studio system is going to be a really interesting season yet again in 2023. I think we can probably say the sort of main takeaway from both this explosion of international content and the sort of potential for what will come from the WGA strike is perhaps a a kind of death of mainstream or at least a kind of end of monoculture? What do you think? So the thing is that audience is empowered by digital production, but also actually more crucially digital distribution are now empowered to go deeper and weirder 
And weirder in this case can also mean just from a different cultural circle. And that, I think, is a huge creative opportunity that's going to seismically shift the way that we consume our entertainment. Fantastic. Well, we will look forward to seeing what emerges from this uh, disruptive period. And uh, I will speak to you next week. Thank you very much, Julian. <laughs>